Hi, you're listening to Redneck Theology, a short program providing a common sense look at Christianity. I'm your host, Bill Witte. Questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Now, on with the broadcast. An end to preaching. I submit to you the idea we have for the most part seen an end of preaching. Yay! Well, come on now. Be honest. It's the first thought to some of you were had that were listening. Admit it. I'm quite sure also a few of you thought that I must be living in some sort of seclusion in order to make such a statement. Christians and non-Christians both have to wonder sometimes about the abundance uh, or perhaps even an overabundance of preaching programs. It seems the airwaves and the internet are saturated. Is it doing any good? Should it continue? Is it time to pull the plug? In the light of this, how could I even suggest we're witnessing an end to preaching? Let me ask this. Is all of what we're hearing actually preaching? That last question may seem a bit strange. What is preaching, really? Are all pastors preachers? In the broadest definition, preaching is simply publicizing or making something known. Now, in that sense, what I do here meets the definition. But also, the nightly news meets that definition, too. Obviously, the word and even the concept no longer holds the same widely accepted meaning as when it was pinned into the ancient Greek and Hebrew, which we translate into our modern Bible. We've come to associate preaching almost exclusively with the promotion of religion. Virtually anyone making use of some platform, uh, an opportunity, or some kind of medium to spout off about religion and or the Bible, well, they get labeled a preacher. I, I am a preacher. I admit that. I am a preacher. But I don't preach in this podcast. What I do here is teach. In groups claiming an association with Christianity, the term preacher usually applies to pastors, evangelists, or some other sanctioned ministers of some sort. Whatever they say from the pulpit, or even any other venue, as long as they're referring to the Bible or Christianity, well, we call it preaching. This concept brings me back to my earlier submission that we are witnessing an end to preaching. In the vast majority of churches on any given Sunday, amid the entertainment and often refreshments, a great wealth of Bible knowledge is passed on. The Bible colleges and seminaries concentrate on teaching students the history, the culture, languages, the geography of Bible times, the the lands, the people. The result over the last decades shifted from what comes from the pulpits. It shifted it from preaching to teaching. We needed and still need teaching. It continually amazes me how many folks spend the majority of their lifetime with some type of church involvement and they missed the basic foundational truths of the Bible. Teaching must continue. One of the ministry gifts the Bible tells us God gave to the church is teachers. They were placed in the church by God. They are becoming and will be a threat to the true proclaiming of the gospel, however. Okay, now wait a minute. Before you turn me off, listen to the warning that Paul gave the young pastor Timothy in his second letter to him. That's 2 Timothy, 4th chapter and the 3rd verse. For the time will come when they will not endure sound, sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Time and time again people stand in the pulpit quoting or reading this passage, and they're telling the listeners how they're not here to tickle their ears, but to tell the truth. Then some admonition from the Bible is taught. Taught not truly preached. Across this country, pulpits and media outlets are full of teachers. The Word of God is taught without being proclaimed. The truths are dissected and explained in detail. Crowds tune in or attend services where they hear about the Bible. They are learning the concepts and the truths academically. The Bible study groups and Sunday schools delve into the latest books about prayer and spiritual gifts, and servitude, while the Bible sets to the side as a secondary reference. Many of the sermons revolve around books and quotes from 
others about a Christian topic. Even where the Bible is the only book quoted, the text is picked apart and taught about rather than proclaimed in power and demonstration. Much of Christianity has gathered around teachers with fantastic amounts of Bible knowledge. They stand in awe about things they learn from the pastors and other staff members. And while they gain a great deal of knowledge, they pat each other on the back, so to speak, about the great teachings which scratch the itching of their ears. The demonstration of the power of God, by and large, is absent. Perhaps enough prayer requests are reported as answered to encourage folks that, well, God's present, but no real excitement exists about it. Witnessing some manifestation on occasion becomes an encouraging break from the normal experience. The prophet Amos spoke of a time that an unusual famine would exist. Amos, the 8th chapter and 11th verse, says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The word hearing, as translated here, refers to giving ear to, or taking to heart, obeying, showing forth, and now get this, publishing, or making known. Publishing and making known is exactly what we are told to do with the gospel. It also meets the general definition of preaching. We are to proclaim it. We are to. Us. Not somebody else. We live in a time where this famine grows and those starving don't even realize it. It's as if much of the church world sits in the middle of a grocery store starving. They point to all the food around them, proclaiming they have plenty. And on occasion, well, someone might open a bag or a can and share it. They get enough to sustain them, but they're weak and they're hungry. They really don't have any power to them. When someone new comes in, why, they show them the abundance of food and encourage them to stay and admire the vast array available. Many have actually forgotten how to open a bag or open a can for themselves. The old-fashioned preachers are just that, old-fashioned. The excitement and enthusiasm they demonstrate, it, it's just for show. They're putting on an act. Why do they have to be so loud anyway? They need to be more ordered and structured in their presentation. They, they need to understand the idea of calling people out of the congregation to come forward for specific prayer or a need. That's embarrassing. They need to be more reserved. Jesus said if we are embarrassed about him, he would demonstrate the same attitude toward us. You never heard that? Read Luke, ninth chapter and 26th verse. Jesus' words are, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words... Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. That word translated to shame carries the same basic meaning as embarrassed. I know some of you listening have been taught widely varying concepts of Christianity. Let me ask you this. Are you convinced that you're going to heaven or are you hoping you will? Do you know it? You know you're going based on the Bible, or are you counting on your church's guidelines being based on the Bible? And that is sufficient enough. Learning church doctrine based on the Bible and learning what the Bible says to do amount to two different things. The Bible says in Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It leaves a choice up to you to choose to believe and make a verbal confession or not. Making a confession involves a commitment. If you'll commit to making God your boss or Lord, he'll help you keep that commitment. You don't have to do anything to prepare for it first. If you ask him to forgive all your sins, he'll do it, and he'll make you clean, innocent from all that you've ever done. That's a promise given in the first epistle of John, the very first chapter in the ninth verse. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If you'd like to commit your life to Jesus, then you can pray with me right now. It's okay to repeat the words, just as long as you mean them from your heart. Okay? Well, let's go. Dear God, I admit I have sinned, and I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sins, and I'm asking you to forgive them all. I trust that Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for my sins. I want him to be my boss. With your help, I will turn away from sin and live according to your word, the Bible. Thank you for hearing me and saving me just now. Amen. Now it's time to put the faith you just exercised into action. Preach. Yeah, I said preach. Go tell somebody you just got saved. Tell them what happened. You can even lead them in a similar prayer if they'd like to be saved too. Learn all you can about God. The best way is by reading His Word daily. And before you read, something else to do daily is pray. It's just talking to God and listening for His answers. In your prayer, ask Him to speak to you from His Word and to help you understand. Going to Sunday school and Bible studies where they actually study the Bible will help you gain much of the teaching you'll need. Worshiping with other believers is important too. Worship somewhere that you can hear preaching, where the person in the pulpit is excited about God and proclaiming His Word, not just teaching about it. Yes, I, I realize for some of you this might mean changing churches. God can lead you in doing that, if that's a need. Keep active telling people what God is doing in your life. Proclaim Him. Speak out whether it's convenient or comfortable or not. In your life, let there never be an end of preaching. That's our program for today. I'm Bill Witte, thanking you for listening to Redneck Theology. Your questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Please join me again next time for more Redneck Theology.